Ah, oh, well, this is we're into the new year since September of uh, the Hebrew year of 5782, and it's called the voice of the sun. So you should expect to hear the voice of the Son of God in your ear this year coming. Also, it's the voice of the sons as the sons arise in the house and a new generation emerges. We're going to be hearing their voice as well. So, ha, 2021, it's coming to an end. How would you label it? How would you label this year? What would you call it? You know, mostly we, we call a year something at the beginning of the year, like the voice of the sun. Or um, if, if the year ends in a four, it's always about an open door. If it ends in a seven, it's about a heaven. If it's about ten, it's about a hen. But uh, maybe not. Um, but, but the real name for the year is what you give it at the end of the year. So what would you name this year? You don't have to call it out because the year's been pretty on the nose at times. <laughs> I just want to say to you today, offer it up to the Lord. Whatever that name is, just offer it up to the Lord and close it off. Close it off, you know. Because when you close off a year, you're ready for the new. And you don't want to be dragging the old skeletons out of your closet, into the new year with you. So for us, some of us, that might be in a time of overlap as we get rid of the old and start the new. It might be an overlap. But closure is important. You've got a month left of this year to get your head around that. Closure is important. Deal with the fear of this year. Deal with the fear of this year, the disappointments, the failures... Because we all unconsciously organise our life around our deepest fears. We organise and we reorganise our lifestyles according to what is the deep fear inside us. So it's good to be able to get rid of that and bring it to the surface and look at it so you don't have to walk with a stone in your shoe into the new year. Is that cool? And then, of course, those old skeletons won't have to come and haunt you again in 2022. So close the year with victory and authentic Thanksgiving. Seeing it's Thanksgiving Day. Finish what you started. Anybody here a good finisher? <laughs> Finish what you flipping all started. You know, it's... Uh, it's energising when you do that. Uh, and it's also very satisfying to actually finish some of the projects that you started. And I had a feeling that there were a lot of people here who started projects through the year because you thought, I've got extra time in COVID. And you got bored with them and you didn't finish them. Well, the call of the Lord today is be a finisher. Be a finisher so that you can get into your next project. So we have some books up here and... It's called The Spirit of the Finisher. And, uh, and I wrote this book several years ago because I hadn't finished anything. <laughs> you know the sermons we preach, eh? The books we write, they're by way of confession. Gets it out of our system, see? And so I wrote The Spirit of the Finisher and uh, I think there's enough here uh, for... Uh, for one for each family, if you've already bought one, sorry about that. You can stick it in somebody else's Christmas shopping, uh, stocking, I don't care. But if we run out, there's some more out the back. So when I'm finished, just please come and get a Spirit of the Finisher. Let me just read a page to you. Is that okay? When God asks a question, it's not because he doesn't know the answer. So when he asks, what do you see? It isn't a trick question. He's wanting us to see beyond the obvious. But I was caught off guard by this very question when the Lord asked me, Rory, what do you see? 
And I responded with tombstones. I see tombstones, which was to be expected since I was walking through the cemetery at the time. A sustained silence ensued, so I looked around for a more impressive answer. The problem is that there's not much else in the cemetery except gravestones, or so I thought. In the quietness of my own heart, the Lord replied, I see unfinished assignments. Ouch! Maybe there was more unfinished assignments walking around that day than in the graves that day. I knew that the Lord was provoking me to finish some of my projects that I had started and set aside through discouragement or, to be more honest, lack of self-discipline. Not that that would apply to you. We, have all, uh, we all seem to have unfinished projects hidden away, strewn along the pathway like breadcrumbs. A book almost completed. I've got three at the moment. <laughs> Jesus, help me. A university degree half finished. Never been guilty of that. A song that was never sung. A new invention waiting for someone else to take out the patent. An application for, a, for the job of your dreams that bumped into its use by date and slid into the past. Life's assignments are discovered rather than chosen. So it is inevitable that we find ourselves experimenting before the real assignment is revealed. I marvel that an unfinished project would matter to God. After all, when he calls time's up, that's it. Sorry about your projects. So I got the message that he was not referring to those projects rather that ran out of time but the ones that ran out of intention. So you may find some helpful hints in there and I'd be well served to practice what I preach and what I write more than I do. However, the ideas are good. <laughs> He's looking at you. And so, I'm thinking that maybe there's a slide with a whole lot of scriptures on it that's coming up. And uh, if not, it doesn't matter. I'm just not going to read all the scriptures today for the sake of time. But for those of you, the Bereans among us, who, who search the scriptures, as Paul said, the Bereans who search the scriptures to see if these things be so. So there they all are. And you can search the scriptures and check me out. But I will just tell the story. Is that okay? See, the, the process of our walk with God is about going from one level of glory to the next level of glory. And that requires finishing or closing down some things so that we can be commissioned into the new. Sounds great. Sounds great. But as Graham Cook says, that in between those two postures between the conversion and the commissioning, there's a conversion of your heart. And that's how you get, hallelujah, from glory to glory. It's about the conversion. It's not about the closure or the commissioning. It's what happens in the process. Don't you hate it? And many of us this year have dealt with the conversion of our heart in many different ways and it hasn't looked so good sometimes. Yeah, just moving right along. <laughs> but I, I do believe that for those of you who have been disappointed and disenfranchised during this year, that it's part of pushing you into a new commissioning. Are you with me? Sometimes God shifts us, even when we hate it. So I want to talk to you today about the Apostle Peter and his process of going from closure to commissioning. And most of you will know that story. And the references are there for you. Well, Peter the fisherman. Peter the fisherman. He'd worked all night 
He was tired and maybe even just a little bit cranky, you know. Fishing will do that for you. And Jesus is watching from the shore and he sees in Peter the capacity of apostleship. But right now, all he's got to work with is a cranky old stinky fisherman. That's what he's got to work with. But see, God sees potential in you, but potential without the conversion of your heart is a misnomer. You can have all the potential in the world, but if your heart is not converted to be able to walk through the place and get into the new project, the new commissioning, yea, verily I say unto thee. But Jesus said to Peter, hey, Peter, push out into the deep. And Peter says, oh, Lord, we've worked all night. And then he uses the big N word, nevertheless. Nevertheless, good word, you should use that. It's a good word when you're discouraged. Nevertheless, nevertheless, we will launch out. And you know the story. Peter puts down the nets and caught so many fish that the nets broke. And Peter has an aha moment. Aha! Peter has an encounter with the voice of the sun, which is what this year is about. Peter is smacked with the anointing. And he's heading headfirst into revelation like he'd never believed. And it's all at an inconvenient moment and it all hit at once. This is often the way God deals with us. You know, we, like gentle Jesus, meek and mild, look upon this little child. Right, Kat? Yeah, it's lovely. And then life happens. And then maybe Jesus is not so gentle. Maybe he gets a whip and chases out the thieves out of the church. So sometimes we're actually confronted rather than just smoothed and eased. And what's Peter's response when they let down the nets and catch such a big haul of fish? Peter falls on his face. He, he does a face plant and he says, Depart from me, O Lord, for I am a sinful man. As if God didn't know. As if this was news. See, Romans chapter 2 verse 4 says, It's the kindness of God. The kindness of God that leads us into repentance. He's kind to us. And sometimes it may not look like he's kind. Other times it's extravagant kindness. Either way, the intention is to get us to repentance one way or another. And what's Jesus' response to Peter? Peter didn't cop a lecture from Jesus. Peter has an invitation for more than fish. He says, follow me, Peter, and I will make you. I will make you. I will make you. That's what the Lord says to us all. Follow me and I will make you. I will make you. Sometimes it's a fisher of men and sometimes it's something else. But follow me and I will make you. It's a very personal call for each one of us. And Peter goes, Woohoo! Yep, I'm in. Let's go. Finally, I can finish fishing. See? And he leaves his nets and he follows Jesus. Peter follows because there's a promise of a commissioning for him. I will make you. That's the long-term goal. That's the commissioning. Follow me and I will make you. And we have many calls to follow through life because sometimes we finish the assignment and we go through the process again. Closure, conversion, <laughs> commissioning. Oh, beautiful. See, we just go through that process. 
Well, in this process of converting pe Peter's heart, it's the same with converting your heart. And I suspect this year many of you have done a face plant. So in this process, there's a kaleidoscope of failure, <laughs> revelation, idiot suggestions, roosters crowing, fish. Oh, I knew it had come. <laughs> Thank you. Fish with coins in their mouths. Ikea moments. That was for a friend. And a whole lot more stuff. But that, and that all comes in the mess of God getting you to do something otherwise you would not have looked at, otherwise you would not have thought about. And out of the mess comes the message from him to your heart. So, question for you today, are you in conversion? Are you in the process? Are you heading for a commissioning? Have you had to close something off? So let's travel just a little bit further with Peter and see how it works for him. Everyone picks on Peter because he's such a classic. You know, all the other disciples seem to have been somewhat reserved or they seem to have been somewhat pious, you know, except a couple of outbreaks from John and his mates who called down sons of thunder. But Peter was just so disgustingly human and we can all identify with this dude. I just love Peter and, and I love him because he's my excuse. And so let's just travel a little bit further with Peter and see some of the things that happened in his life just briefly. Well, one of the major things was when Jesus said to the people, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And as the poem says, they spoke of many prophets who this earthly scene had trod, but Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so Peter is like preening himself. <laughs> like, I got it. I got that one right. You know? Because Jesus says, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, on your mate. <laughs> Blessed art thou, because flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my father... So Peter's right up there in the revelationary stakes now. He's feeling pretty good about himself. But wait, a couple of verses down. Just you wait, Henry Higgins, just you wait. Peter got a whole lot of kudos out of that, but it just shows you how quickly in the season of converting our hearts that we can oscillate from one thing to another. Almost in the same breath. It's called the conversion of your heart. Don't feel too guilty. There's a commissioning coming. The next incident that's recorded of Peter is Jesus starts to tell them, you know that the chief priests and the elders are going to take me and they're going to beat me and they're going to kill me, but on the third day I'll rise again from the dead. And Peter, who's now got the kudos and the revelation, right? He's right up there with Jesus. He, he's me mate, you know. And at times, I wonder who might be the better. So Peter calls to Jesus and goes, a word if you please, because I'm quiet, I'm QT. All that stuff? Not so, Lord. Not so between you and me. No, no, no not going to happen. We have other plans. You can't say not so and Lord in the same <laughs> sentence for crying out loud. It's an oxymoron. It's either yes, Lord, or just yes or not so. But you can't do the not so and the Lord. You know, it's just not going to work. And Jesus turns to Peter and he says, get thee behind me. 
Oh, but it was in front of all the other disciples who were jealous because he'd had such a great revelation. And now Jesus is saying, Peter, get thee behind me. Don't you call me over here and have this little chat. You get behind me. You get behind me. You are a stumbling block to me. Ouch. Because you do not have in mind the things that are of God, but the things that are of men. He's in conversion. He's in conversion. And as we close something off and we're heading towards an unknown future, there's so much turmoil in us that we act just like Peter because we haven't seen the end from the beginning. And what Jesus says to Peter is, the enemy's goal is to vex your spirit and you don't know what spirit you are of in the time when your heart is in conversion. Satan will vex your spirit so that you operate on his behalf. Save him a lot of work. Yeah. Does anybody hear what I'm saying? Or yeah. is my confession like, you know, you should be a bit more interactive about this? <laughs> so now Peter's been with Jesus for three years. And they're in the garden, and Judas has nicked off to betray Jesus. And come back with the high priest and the high priest's offsider and the Roman contingent and it's looking pretty threatening for Jesus. So Peter to the rescue. Da -da -da -da. And Peter draws his sword. He's ready. He's got the hull of the Roman Empire and a sword. But he's got the goods for it. So he wants to start a revolution, does Peter. And uh, so he cuts off the ear of the assistant to the high priest. That's the most funny thing in the Bible to me. <laughs> I can see that happening. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't know, maybe you've just got a warped sense of humour, but it, <laughs> there goes the ear. <laughs> Jesus picks it up. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> no, he didn't do that. <laughs> I saw that in a movie. No, he didn't do that. <laughs> Jesus picks it up and he puts it back on the right way up. <laughs> when it, if I was Jesus in that situation, I would have left a lasting memory. Peter's in conversion. And the closer you get to the commissioning, it seems to me the more conflict that you feel. Now, here we go. Jesus is before the Sanhedrin because we're going to have lunch pretty soon. Jesus is before the Sanhedrin and Peter's outside. What's he doing? He's warming himself by the fire, right? Well, wouldn't you know it? There's a servant girl there. And, and the poem... Says, and a servant girl stood listening with too much time to spend, and mockingly to Peter said, Why, you must be his friend. I never knew him, Peter said. Then, as they would depart, Lord Jesus turned and looked at him, and that look broke Peter's heart. He's in conversion. See? And like I said, the closer you get to the new project, to the new commissioning, the deeper the tests become. Sorry, just thought I'd say that. Remember, it's glory to glory, balanced by faith to faith, but it always turns out good. But I'm talking about this year and I'm talking about you stepping into your next year, recognising that there might be some issues that you have to deal with so that you can actually... Break off some of the old mud that you're wearing. So the crucifixion comes and the resurrection happens. And we could stay on that for about a day or a week. 
But now Peter has gone back fishing. He said to the other, I'm going fishing. And they also said, we also go with thee. So the whole bunch of them, gone fishing. See, Peter has quit. It was all too much. Can't work it out. He realised he wasn't up for the job. All hat, no cattle. He wasn't good enough for the job. Well, wouldn't you know it? Jesus. It just happens to be on the beach that morning, barbecuing some barra and prawns. No, no prawns. And you know the story, how Jesus invites them and Peter, who's just in his undies, he, he didn't even wait for the boat to come to the shore. He just jumps off and swims, as you do apparently. And as Jesus is feeding them breakfast, there's this incredible interaction that happens between them, which is about a series of ten sermons on their own. But he's going to check out Peter's heart because he's about to commission Peter. (laughs) And he says, Peter, do you love me? Peter goes, oh, no. I thought I did. I don't know what happened to that. But thou knowest, Lord. Always a safe answer. Thou knowest, Lord. Peter, do you love me? And in that encounter on the beach at the barbecue that morning, Jesus heals Peter's heart. He heals Peter's heart from all his disappointments and his failures and, yes, his successes, Because we can get our hearts wounded in our success as much as we can in our failures. So Jesus heals Peter's heart at that time and because of what he saw in him originally when he was a stinky old fisherman, he now makes Peter the greatest of the apostles, the revivalist, the healer the apostle extraordinaire, yes, indeed, the martyr. (laughs) Thanks be to God, I say, for his incredible mercy. Thanks be to God for his incredible mercy towards you and me as we flapped around this year like half-dead fish looking for water in our awkwardness and our resentment and our everything else that we feel, thank God for his mercy. It's true every morning. Thank God that he always finds the gold in the midst of the dirt, you know. Thank God for the second chance and the third, Justin, and the fourth and the fifth and the tenth. Because we're all in process and just when we get commissioned and we think we've arrived, God's got another plan as well. And so we're going to have to start from closure and go through this thinking process again. Because God's more interested in what you're becoming than in what you're doing. And this has been a rough year for many. And some have lost jobs. And some have lost contracts. And some have lost friends or even relatives. And the word of the Lord to you is, lovest thou me more than these? It's a good closing word before a commissioning. (laughs) Lovest thou me more than these? Well, you've got a month before the year finishes and I've got four minutes You've got a month before this year finishes. Let me go back to the beginning. What do you need to finish or continue with to the point of finishing? What is it that you clenched your fist about this year? And I want to give you the antidote. It's very simple. 
All the answers of God are very simple. They're just flipping hard to do, you know. And I want to tell you that the answer is very simple. Start to give thanks. I don't want to. I don't feel like it. It's just, it's not fair actually. No, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. not. You know, I have my hissy fits. Uh, I usually have them on the front veranda because no one can see me out there except my husband who's used to it all by now. And, And sometimes I don't feel very thankful and I'm ticked off about something. And so I've learnt to start to just give thanks, just give thanks. So I sit out there and I go, thank you for the sky. <laughs> it's a bit grey. Lord, it's how I feel. No, no, just thank you for the sky. Thank you for the trees. Thank you that there's no potholes in the roof. And you start to give thanks and you start way out there and it comes closer and closer and closer and closer until your heart is getting tuned into the state of conversion that he's looked for. I want to say to you today, it's not just coming out of a nice little saying. It's coming out of the experience of life where I've failed a hundred times but at long last, and by now I ought to be, getting the idea, the antidote to depression is thanksgiving. The antidote to depression. And so you might have to give thanks for the sky to start with, I don't care. But as you give thanks, and you give thanks, and you give thanks, it's the very antithesis of what the enemy puts on you. Because in depression, it's because you have received the condemnation from the enemy, and Jesus doesn't. When you repent, he says, I will make you. So I think as we all desire to bear fruit, we say we want to bear fruit, I think sometimes this year may have overextended some people. And when you get overextended, you tend to produce wood, not fruit. Think of the old... Grapevine, the woody old thing. No grapes this year. Because I'm stuffed. <laughs> Guys, the trials of our life, they, they don't create us. They reveal us. They reveal us. So there's a commissioning that's about to happen, a new year. COVID is still here in the new year. What are we going to do? It may be around for many years. Are we going to be salty for the rest of that time? You know? Or are we going to say, God is leading me into something that I had no idea I had potential for. And in the process of this, my heart has been converted, it's been broken, it's been angry, it's been eye-caring, it's been, you don't know about that, but it's been doing stuff. But today as we give thanks, let it be not just a one day but let it be a habit that we get into. We get into a habit of thanksgiving. So when the enemy comes against us, we know how to deal with it and we prepare our hearts for the commissioning that God wants and is waiting to give us. Is that okay? I trust that's helpful to you, to some of you anyway. Amen.